Welcome to the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Geary. Fasten your seatbelts, please. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Airline travel can be stressful for many, but add to that turbulence and it can be nerve wracking. About 80% of Americans, that's about four out of every five, have flown before on a plane. So turbulence is something most people can identify with. Things are going smoothly until they aren't. It can go from the slight baby bounces, the little hiccups to remind you that you're not on solid ground, to the jolts and the shakes, or the drops and the dives, reminiscent of a roller coaster at the amusement park. Sometimes the turbulence happens in the middle of the flight, an erratic jet stream or air pocket that disrupts the ease with which things were going. Often though, on takeoff, or especially as you get ready to land, things can get bumpy. So when the announcement comes on to fasten your seatbelts, when the pilot from the cockpit or the crew comes on and tells you to buckle up, you'd be wise to listen. Just a few months ago, a flight to Hawaii hit some extreme mid-air turbulence about 36,000 feet, just a half hour or so before landing, and it was unexpected, no warning. Some thunderstorms in the area likely to blame, and one passenger said there was actually two intense drops of altitude, one so strong that her boyfriend's water bottle flew into the ceiling and actually cracked it. There's pictures online of the cracked ceiling. Another's mother had just sat down and had not time to buckle up, and she flew up and hit the ceiling too. People were bleeding, bracing themselves, and of course, crying. 36 people were injured on that flight, including three flight attendants. 20 people went to the ER, 11 in serious condition. But all 278 passengers and 10 crew members rattled for sure at the unexpected turbulence. I'm sure there had been bumps along the way on that flight, as there are in most, but the extreme turbulence? It occurred just before the initial point of descent began. They were almost home, had made the majority of the journey just fine, and boom, things got rocking and rolling. As we turn to Mark 13 on this podcast, Jesus is warning of turbulence on the horizon. He relays a message to fasten our seatbelts that things will get bumpy. From the time of his departure to the time of his return, it will be a long flight, and turbulence is sure to occur all along the way and get worse shortly before landing, before his return. The last few sections have been centered at the temple in Jerusalem, a bustling place full of religious activity, especially this week of Passover when these events occur in the text. Much of the activity to man's liking, and not necessarily to God's liking. Jesus had turned over tables, sending out the money changers and those selling the sacrifices with jacked up prices, disrupting what he called a den of thieves and an exhortation to get back to God's intent for a house of prayer. He was confronted by the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the scribes, warning those at the temple to beware of religiosity that shows no signs of fruit. And Jesus watched at the treasury, how people gave noting that a widow who gave a measly two mites in man's eyes gave more than all the others combined, having given with a true heart of worship. And we ended on the last podcast with Jesus' shocker, that the temple itself would not be around for much longer, something his disciples did not expect to hear, and that is the springboard for what we'll look at on the next podcasts. And Jesus talks of turbulent times and reminds them to buckle up. So let's take a look at Mark 13. It's Tuesday of Passion Week, and Jesus will soon be going to the cross. And as Jesus and the disciples leave the temple area this day, scriptures tell us in Mark 13, verses 1 and 2. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Although they had been there before, the disciples are still in awe of this impressive sight. Teachers, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? Their time there that day had not exactly been the most positive. Lots of confrontation and conflict. And maybe this is the disciples trying to smooth things over. But Jesus, things at the temple are not all that bad, right? I mean, look how grand it is. Lots of focus and efforts to make the temple great again. The building project had already gone on for a few decades. Herod's temple, a huge effort to make it the centerpiece and envy of all. In the, pro- in the end, the project would take about 80 years. Imagine a whole generation would see it with scaffolds and cranes, caution tape and under construction signs marking it for 80 years. Herod's temple project would finally be completed in 63 AD, just seven years before it would be destroyed completely, not one stone left upon another as history shows us. 
but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The disciples are impressed, as anyone would be. History tells of the beauty of the ancient temple. Apparently, it was covered on the outside with gold plates. Imagine the sun shining on them. It was blinding, accounts say. The parts that were not gold were blocks of marble, a pure white, and strangers thought from a distance that there was snow on the temple. It was a magnificent temple, this Herod's temple. Take a trip to Israel today, and on tours you can still view some of the massive stones that were part of the retaining wall. Huge blocks of limestone, some 50 feet wide, 25 feet high, and 15 feet deep, solid rocks, one piece. In fact, most modern construction cranes would not be able to lift them. So imagine the effort in the ancient world of getting such massive rocks quarried and transported to the temple. This is impressive. And the disciples think so too, reminding Jesus, teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. But alas, the temple had become an idol for many. And though appearing to be grand and great, it meant more to many in that day than God himself did. And here, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus the Messiah, has just spent a day at the temple, and he was ignored by most and rejected by many. Jesus had even told them earlier, as we see in Matthew 12, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. He was referring to himself. If they had only recognized it, but they didn't. They didn't because they were too focused and concerned with polishing their idols to see their own reflections than to notice God in the flesh had graced them with his presence. So the temple, impressive? Yes. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Because, like most idols, the Lord will eventually topple them over to shake things up and remind us and show us not to put our trust in those idols. Like when Pharaoh in Egypt was resistant and would not let the people go, each of the ten plagues was a different affront on one of their idols, reminding all that God was greater and all idols were inferior. And so it will be with the idols in our lives. If we're trusting in idols, they will begin to topple. They will begin to quiver. They will begin to shake. They will not hold up under the weight. And we're so cast off those idols and put our trust back upon the Lord. And we move on in this podcast to Mark 13, verses 3 and 4. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all of these things will be fulfilled? Jesus got their attention, and they want to know more. So they are opposite the temple on the Mount of Olives. Jesus gives what is known as the Olivet Discourse, recorded in Matthew and Luke's Gospels as well. A whole lot wrapped up into some full chapters, important things of what is to come. Remember, Jesus is winding up his earthly ministry. Within days, hours even, the final events begin to take place. Jesus will not leave them as orphans. He will send the Holy Spirit to teach them. But there is a lot to brief them on before he's ripped away from them. One of the big things that was still not clear was the whole thing with Jesus being the Messiah. Was he going to reign and rule to kick out the Romans? That was the expectation, at least. We, in hindsight, know that the cross is just days away from the scene. That the most important reason that Jesus came was to pay for sin. But on that side of the cross... They're still trying to figure out how all of this is going to go together, how it's going to tie together. The lines blurred of Jesus' first coming to redeem man and restore us to God, and a second coming to establish his kingdom, to reign and to rule in the way that they were anticipating. So as they cross the valley from the temple and ascend the Mount of Olives opposite, Jesus takes some time to lay things out. Not all the details of things, but enough to give them at this point, knowing that the Holy Spirit would come and teach them the things that they still needed to know, to fill in the blanks as needed. So again, verses 3 and 4. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all of these things will be fulfilled? When will these things be, that one stone will not be left upon another and be thrown down? And what sign do we look for when all of these things will be fulfilled? These are their two questions. In Matthew's recording, there seems to be three related questions. We read in Matthew's account, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? Three questions. When will this temple topple? What is the sign of your coming? And what is the sign of the end of the age? Important to note, since Matthew was written for the Jews, full of scriptures from the Old Testament to prove that Jesus was their long-awaited and prophesied Messiah. 
So this expanded recording of the question asking, what will be the sign of your coming? It was important because that was biggest in the eyes of the Jews. Mark was written for the Romans, the Greeks, the rest of the world who would hear about the Savior who came. And the fact that Rome would come in and topple this temple at some point, an important piece of information for that time at that, uh, for the world at that time, with all the politics and the power plays going on. In fact, most scholars say Mark was likely written sometime between the mid-60s AD and the early 70s, just before or after the destruction of the temple that Jesus tells them about here in this section. So imagine that. Some 40 years before it happens, Jesus tells them about it. Some of them would actually see that, and those reading would see it. Jesus writing the headline decades before it goes to press. It's like if someone in the early 1970s in New York City had said, see those twin towers that are being built? I tell you, within 30 years, two planes will fly into them and they will stand no more. And 30 years later, when it happened and all the world watched, you would remember and think, okay, what else did they tell me? Because if that happened, which I thought was impossible, what else is about to happen that they already told me? I better be paying attention. Jesus' statement that not one stone would be left upon another. This was a mile marker that that generation would actually see unfold. And Jesus told them in advance. So while Jesus does address that question, apparently he takes the opportunity as well to slip in information about his return and about the end of the age. Because while Mark does not record that question, Jesus knows, knows that it's important for them. So while giving info about the questions about when will these things take place and this destruction of the temple, he tags on additional information to answer questions they may not have asked, or at least not recorded in Mark, about his return and about the end of the age, knowing that the temple destruction will be a blip on the radar in the bigger picture. But there are more important, turbulent things coming. And by recording those now in the Olivet Discourse, they would say, well, if Jesus was right about the temple, something they would see in a few decades from that point, then we can trust Jesus with things that will be fulfilled thousands of years later surrounding his second coming and the end of the age. That's one of the reasons that we can put our trust in the Bible, because throughout it is full of prophecy, many, most of them actually already having come true. And if God was right about those things, but the things that remain, he must be right about those as well. So Jesus begins his answer, verses five through eight. And Jesus answering them began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Jesus begins his answer. It is going to be lengthy, somewhat of an info dump, and don't worry, we won't get through it all on this podcast. As Jesus lays out pretty much all that will happen between then and his return in 2,000 years, sort of giving them the big things to look for during that huge window of history. In verses 5 through 8, he lays out for them things to be aware of, turbulence along the way, deception and false Christs, conflicts and wars among nations, earthquakes, famines and other troubles, he says. Matthew throws diseases in there in his version of this. Some later verses will talk about persecutions and tribulations for believers and the gospel going forth into all the world. We'll take a look at those on one of our next podcasts. But Jesus first gives them some of the symptoms to look for in answering the questions, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming? Which Matthew records them asking. And what will be the sign of the end of the age? Those three questions. It seems like all of those things we just mentioned are happening if you just turn on the news, right? Deceptions, wars, earthquakes, famines, other troubles, and that all of those things have been happening for 2,000 years, right, as we look at history. And that these guys speaking with Jesus probably saw that in the years after Jesus died and he was buried and resurrected and ascended, telling them that he was coming, they saw all those things probably too, right? So some think that all of these things were fulfilled in the lifetime of these disciples that it all wrapped up with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the Olivet Discourse, that's all Jesus is referring to is the next 30 or 40 years of history. This is called the preterist view. And indeed, all these things Jesus talked about, these signs, they were evident in those times as they have been throughout history, as they are even to this day. One issue though with the preterist view comes later in the chapter when Jesus will say in verse 19, for in those days there will be tribulation, 
such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. What took place in 70 AD was bad. It destroyed Jerusalem, the temple, sent the Jews scattering around the world. But can that be seen as tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be? The world has seen what many would say are bigger tribulations since 70 AD, world wars, and for the Jews in particular, the Holocaust comes to mind. Consider this, Jesus may have thrown it all in the mixing bowl, things that would be seen there in their generation to be fulfilled within a few decades, things that would be seen throughout the ages, the words for those who follow him and endure such hardships, and things that would be seen just prior and at his coming knowing that these words would be preserved and they would not return void. All generations from that time until his return, reading and looking for them, for hope, for guidance, for direction, and for clarity, something we should do with the scriptures in the midst of turbulence that they would encounter. The truth is, we still see these things in our lives at this time. Deception and false Christs, conflicts and wars among nations, earthquakes, famines, and other troubles. We see these in the headlines all of the time. Deception. It's interesting how people can see the same event through such different lenses. Some things that make so much sense seem so clear to you, others see completely differently, and you wonder, are we looking at the same issue? Whether that be politics or economics or gender questions or morality, even history, it takes discernment to try and figure out not just what is being said, but why it is being said and who is saying it. Believers need discernment now, maybe even more than ever. But with that deception, there is also religious deception. Jesus put it in this context. For many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many, masquerading as representatives of Jesus. And many will follow, unfortunately. That can even point to not necessarily people claiming to be Jesus himself, but claiming to be his messengers, his representatives. False faiths that are said that they're Christian but Jesus is not on board, actually. Whether that be Christian cults that have veered from the gospel of grace, or even Christian movements that once were right on, but now they're teaching, tolerating, standing for, and promoting things that Jesus would never stand for, and many will be deceived. Careful of new revelations, or new versions of the gospel, or what are promoted as restorations, supposedly. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change with the times. He doesn't change with the culture. Jesus mentioned wars and rumors of wars and nations rising against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. The 20th century saw war like no other. So many lives taken. Constant conflict. Of course, in World War I, somewhere between 18 and 23 million killed, either in combat or civilian casualties. In World War II, 70 to 85 million killed. That's 100 million or so just between those two conflicts. And even now, there's always talk of potential war and conflict with nations. And with modern technology, war is never too far away. A couple years ago, a glitch in the emergency alert system sent out a message and error to those in Hawaii to take cover alerted to incoming missiles, and they did. My sister and her family huddled in the hallway, waiting for a blast. It was a plausible precaution and action. Wars and rumors of wars. No one would have put it past North Korea to do something like that, because it's the world we live in. False alarm, thankfully, for my sister and the rest of the state, but unnerving nonetheless. Even recently, a, quote, weather balloon allowed to float over the U.S. for a week before being shot down by the military. China and the U.S. not exactly on good terms, and turn on the news channels, and the commentators are always hinting at the next conflict that could take place if the dam breaks. And speaking of wars and rumors of wars, Ukraine now going on a year of war with Russia at the time of this recording. When Ukraine was invaded, we were talking with friends back in Europe, and they were pretty shaken seeing that war broke out just a few hundred miles away, and they had not expected it. They thought that the threats were just rhetoric, bluff. No one thought it would really happen to their neighbors which we were surprised with since our media in the U.S. had pretty much said it was bound to happen just a matter of time. So we were not surprised watching from a distance. But those even closer, many were taken aback. Interesting how the same conflict can be viewed or interpreted differently from different vantage points. Wars, but also rumors of wars. Also, it says, the nations rising against nations. The word there is ethnos, so ethnic groups. Interesting how much conflict still in our world today over ethnicities. 
tribal and territorial conflicts all over the African continent, one ethnic group or tribal background with animosity toward another. But even in the West, so much conflict again in recent years between ethnicities. Jesus spoke of these things. This would happen, he told his disciples. And just venture into the Middle East and, well, the age-old conflict between the Jews and other ethnic groups, it is always causing tension. Furthermore, Jesus says, there will be earthquakes in various places. At this recording, devastating and heartbreaking earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, over 33,000 dead at the time of this recording. I saw in the headlines, rescuers pulled a Syrian baby girl from the wreckage, and when they pulled her out, she was still attached to the umbilical cord. Apparently, her mother gave birth to her in the rubble after the earthquake caused everything to fall, and she was trapped in the ruins. But her mother, unfortunately, passed away. But by a miracle, the rescuers found the baby, though, and the little girl was named Aya, which is Arabic for a sign from God. And even though some say, well, there have always been these earthquakes, with increased populations impacted, with the instruments we have to measure, and with the global communication that allows the news to travel farther, we're definitely more aware and maybe even more greatly impacted than in times past. Famines are also on the list of bumps along the way, turbulence that we will encounter. I remember as a kid in the 80s, we saw how famine was a real thing in the world. Picture of kids in Africa who were emaciated, thin, very, very sickly, but still with extended bellies because of disease. The song, We Are the World, raising awareness for those in the West to not ignore it. If you didn't eat your food, it was nothing to be told. Eat it at all because there are kids starving in China. But was that an all an 80s thing? I take student groups from time to time to serve at our regional food bank, packing boxes of essentials to send out for distribution because hunger is a real thing where we are. Oklahoma is the fifth hungriest state in the nation. One in five kids in our state face food insecurity, meaning they're not always sure where their next meal is coming from. And around the world, according to the World Food Program, a record 349 million people across almost 80 countries are facing acute food insecurity. That's up from 287 million in 2021. But get this, that makes up a staggering rise of 200 million people compared to pre-COVID-19 pandemic levels. And almost a million people worldwide are fighting to survive in famine-like conditions. About a million people today hungry. So the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, it's real for a lot of people. And in Mark's account of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus rounds out his list of turbulent times by heaping them all into the phrase, quote, and other troubles. Other troubles? Well, take your pick. They abound. In fact, Matthew throws disease in there when we're talking about other troubles. COVID-19, anyone? How fresh this is in our minds and experience. Globally, all of us experiencing not just the illness and the fears that went with it and the death that was associated with it, but all the other repercussions of lockdowns and economic impact, mental health repercussions, those things could definitely come under other troubles. So wait, Justin, are you saying that all of this stuff is right now? Is Jesus just referring to our day? Are we in some tribulation? Or has this always been the case? Have these things taken place throughout all of history? Great observation. We could definitely get lost in all of this, not the direction we will likely take on a podcast of this length. But here's what we can say. These things Jesus told them there on the Mount of Olives in response to the questions, when will these things happen? The temple being destroyed, that is. What will be the sign of your coming? Which Matthew records them asking. And what will be the sign of the end of your age? These things in the first part of Jesus's answer, the deception and the false Christs, the conflicts and the wars among the nations, the earthquakes, the famines, and the other troubles, including diseases. We have seen this turbulence throughout history. There's no period since the time of Jesus' discussion with them without those things happening in Jesus' day throughout history and clearly even now. So why then mention them, Jesus? Is this even helpful or does this just confuse us and cause us to form camps around preterist views, dispensational views, amillennial views, and whatever other views you want to gravitate towards? Well, here are some thoughts. Why does Jesus list these types of turbulence? First, so that they wouldn't doubt Jesus was the Messiah. They're still trying to figure out what it means that he is the Messiah. And these dudes talking to him in Mark 13 believe that he is the Messiah. And the common belief was that the Messiah would make everything right. Because that's what a king does, right? Makes everything right, right? So when Jesus goes to the cross within a few days, and things don't go right the way that they were intending, and then the early church doesn't see everything right, and the world still has turbulence like the earthquakes, the wars, the famines, and so on, some followers might begin to doubt and think, Maybe Jesus was not the Messiah, because if he had been, it should be smooth sailing now, right? Well, no, 
In fact, Jesus would say within a day or so in John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You won't have everything smooth necessarily, but you will have me. And so perhaps Jesus rips off the band-aid for each generation. When you look at the world around you, you'll see things will be messed up. It won't be all smooth and easy and light, but this doesn't mean that I was not the Messiah or that I have abandoned you or that you are in the tribulation yet because these things will happen. And I want to acknowledge that. When Aaron and I got together, it was really clear for both of us. The things that God did were pretty clear for us. We kind of walked into it. The things were, they were seemed pretty smooth and easily actually. And I remember exactly where we were standing. We were in the cafe at her Bible school where I was visiting one weekend and we were talking about how easy it had been and how clear we were on what God was doing. And I said, well, maybe it's so clear because things are going to get really hard at some point. And when they do, we'll need to look back and remember that we were really clear on the fact that God wanted us together so that we can press on. And as those words came out, it was almost like I didn't want them being said, like a word of wisdom in the moment, like I wanted to get them back in my mouth, but I couldn't. And it was true. Things did get hard, as they do in any marriage, but we knew that we had to stick it out because God had shown up at the front and told us that he was in it. Jesus gives a list of things for them that he already acknowledges that they will face. And maybe it's so when they do face them, they can still cling to him and not doubt him. Notice when things get hard in life, how people start to question God. Does God even like me? Is he punishing me? If God were real, then why are things so hard? Or of course, if God were a God of love, then why is the world the way that it is? Right here in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus acknowledged that these things, these turbulent hard things, would be in the picture. And it didn't make him any less the king, any less the Messiah, any less their savior. So important to have promises to cling to when things get hard, to have Jesus to cling to when things get hard, when doubtful and dark circumstances take place, to go back to who God is and what he promises in his word. And even though life and circumstances don't reflect those things right now, God is true and he will be true. Going back to who he is and what he said, even if the world around me looks a bit off. So Jesus gives them a list to watch out for, perhaps first to help them dispel their doubts when he doesn't fix the world, at least not in that first coming. But another thing, take a look at what he says at the end of verse 8, after listing the deceptions, the wars, the uprising, the earthquakes, the famines, and the other troubles. We read, these are the beginnings of sorrows. Ooh, the beginnings of sorrows. Things start out this way. In fact, the phrase beginnings of sorrows speaks of birth pangs, going into labor. The word beginning can mean beginning or origins, the first person or thing in a series, the active cause of something. And the sorrows, well, it can mean the pain of childbirth. So childbirth, those birth pangs start out, not pleasant, I imagine, but then grow and increase in intensity, occurring more frequently and with greater severity than the previous one, because there is a new life about to be born, but it gets harder before the breakthrough. So those things that Jesus spoke of, they would be witnessed by all generations. But many see that as Jesus saying that they will increase in frequency and intensity as we approach the arrival of Jesus for his second coming. Makes sense if we look at the second of the third questions asked by the disciples. What will be the sign of your coming, which Matthew records them asking? And what will be the sign of the end of your age? Watch for these signs, Jesus says, and then watch as they increase in frequency and intensity. Now, in coming podcasts, we'll look at things a bit more, but many see a season of tribulation in the seven years prior to Jesus' return, and that Jesus is pointing to something that is yet to be fulfilled, and that that seven-year tribulation is what Jesus means in verse 19. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God had created until this time, nor ever shall be. And guess what we see in the book of Revelation? Those who see that book describing the future tribulation, all the things on Jesus' list here in Mark 13. The deceptions, a real false Christ, wars, conflicts, earthquakes, famines, other troubles, including disease, environmental disasters, it is a mess. But notice, they will be some of the same things that we see now and have seen throughout history, but on steroids. The most intense intensity, the strongest and wave after wave. So the things that we see now, they are birth pangs, but just not as intense with some of the breathing time in between. So much so that when we get a break, people, even Christians, start to think, 
well, maybe Jesus is not coming back. Maybe these things are not literal because in the breath catching, they forget what we just went through. But in the tribulation, there'll be no time to breathe, no catching a breath, nothing light about it. The intensity is so extreme all around the world of the same things that Jesus told them almost 2000 years ago. But the final round, a no holds barred front row seat to them. Take, for example, the earthquakes. We've seen them since Jesus was there at the temple. We see them in history. We see them even now. But in Revelation 16, it says, And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Now that is a destructive earthquake. See, maybe you've been in a great earthquake, some moving and shaking that got you out of bed or even brought damage to your city or your region. But just before Jesus' return, truly the big one. Or how about wars and conflicts? We see them today and wrapping up until Jesus comes back. And just prior to his return, all the kings of the earth will gather for battle to fight against Jesus as he comes. Revelation 19, 19, the proverbial Armageddon. Even the famines, we see mentioned in the book of Revelation about the prices of things, even simple things costing so much. And deception, false Christs, tons of weirdness masquerading as Christianity today, seemingly more as we move toward Jesus' return. But fast forward, the anticipated Antichrist is deceiving the world, many taking his mark, deceived by what he says and what he does, under the influence of the devil himself. Deception, like never before, the great deceiver. And most of the world would be caught up in it, except those who follow Jesus. That is some intense deception, stronger than the world has ever seen. See how we see those things even in our day, but how intense those same turbulences will get just prior to his return. Birth pangs, birth pangs like never before. It's a gradual ramping up throughout history until it is all out in the tribulation and in full force to close out this chapter of history and usher Jesus in for his second coming. And after all, that is what we should be most excited about, the return of Jesus Christ. Fasten your seatbelts, friends. It is bound to be a bumpy ride, and likely only more turbulent as we draw closer to the return of Jesus. It's something that we should be looking for. In fact, in the Bible, there are more references to Jesus' second coming than to his first eight to one to be more precise. That is 1,845 references to the return of Jesus. 17 books in the Old Testament mention it, and 23 of the 27 New Testament books talk of Jesus coming back. That is one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament talking about Jesus' return. And it's something every generation has been waiting for and should be ready for. Maybe another reason starts out this discussion with a list of the things that each of the generations would be able to recognize in their own day and time, nudging the church through the ages with the thought of, could it be today, Lord? But Jesus should be what we look for, not necessarily all the signs of the times, because those signs point to someone who is coming. And while it can be encouraging to read the headlines or discouraging, depending on your perspective, the Lord has given us so much to meditate on in regard to him. And drawing closer to Jesus now is wise to do, no matter what generation we live in, or how frequently the turbulence comes in the forms of the things that Jesus spoke of here. Paul wrote to a church in Thessalonica in the first century. We looked at it in detail in season two of our podcast, but Paul wrote Thess- Thessalonians within 30 years of this conversation that Jesus has with this group across from the temple. And he wanted to encourage them to look up. Their world was turbulent on a society level as well as on a personal level as persecution was growing against those Christians of the first century. And Jesus wanted them to find hope and comfort that Jesus is going to come to them in the midst of a turbulent world. He closes out chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians with this encouragement or exhortation, this challenge, or maybe even a prayer, and we'll close out with today as our charge for this podcast. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What great things to pray. So Lord, we thank you that your word encourages us to be ready for you. And Jesus, may you make us increase and abound in love to one another and to all. More love, Lord not of our own affections or our desires or our strength, but a supernatural love that comes by your spirit 
a love that marks us as different from this turbulent world, and a love that comes from a source outside of us, your love, Lord, and a love that helps us to love the unlovable. And Jesus established our hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. First, Lord, with us, purify our hearts, make them holy, convict us of sin. May we let go of unforgiveness and idols and anything else that crowds our hearts and robs you of more place within them. And we ask this for all his saints as well. May you establish the hearts of your church, making us holy, a pure spotless bride, waiting for her groom, the church locally, Lord, the church globally, one that is not ashamed when you come. We worship you, Jesus, for the cross that you bore, for your perfect sacrifice, Lord, that gives us life if we will just believe. And that you were obedient to your Father in your first coming with a promise to return again. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.